Welcome to Solo, the single person's guide to a remarkable life. Your host, a behavioral scientist and bachelor, talks to leading experts and successful singles about living solo and living well. Travel more, make things, sleep in when you want to. Here's the playbook for the person who is unapologetically unattached. Now, please welcome Dr. Peter McGraw. One of the things that I like about the book is you use the word ritual. I think that's a special word. It's a word I've talked about in previous podcast episodes. You know, really, we're talking in many ways about habits. And I believe habits are sort of a cheat code to winning in the world. Peter loves the word ritual. I do love that word ritual. And I that like it. That sounded you know, sardonic or judgy. It's not at all. I'm like, <laughs> yes. I underlined and I bolded for audio. Uh, hey, well, part of the reason I have Lily on here is she makes fun of me sometimes. Uh, so it's okay. <laughs> Welcome back. This week, we continue to explore solitude by speaking to an author of a delightful book about daily rituals. The book reveals how many great thinkers use solitude to change the world with their art, music, and ideas. There's so much good information in here, I don't want to delay any further, besides to ask you to review the podcast if you haven't already. I hope you enjoy the episode. Let's get started. Welcome to Solo, the single person's guide to a remarkable life. I'm Peter McGraw. Today's guest is Mason Curry. Mason is a writer and editor living in Los Angeles and the author of the Daily Rituals books, chronicling the day-to-day work habits of more than 300 great creative minds. Note, I'm not in any of them. His freelance writing has appeared in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, The New York Times, and Slate. He also writes The Subtle Maneuvers, a free weekly newsletter on routines, rituals, and wriggling through creative life. Welcome, Mason. Hey, thanks for having me. We are joined by a return guest host, Lily Rains. Lily (laughs) Lily is a storyteller, arts educator, crafter of needlework, and maker of homemade ice cream. Though solo, Lily likes to be, loves to be, actually, part of an ensemble with a shared goal, be it on a softball field, escape room, or getting a play, movie, or TV show made. We're debating this, but I think this is Lily's fourth appearance on solo, maybe technically the fifth, because we did a rerun of one of my most popular episodes. Welcome back, Lily. So good to be here. Hi, Mason. Hey, Lily. (laughs) This episode continues our exploration of solitude, clearly something relevant to us solos. And as part of it, I've been talking to remarkable singles to explore their practices and perspectives about solitude. And here we're going to do is look back at some of the world's greatest thinkers and how they use solitude, perhaps, oftentimes, to do great things, to make great things. And I have to tell you, Mason, it's thrilled to actually talk to you. I have, I've emailed you. I have read your books. Your book is the second most gifted book that I have ever given. And the first is not the Bible. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, like, whatever your publisher tells you about the numbers, I am responsible for at least 10%, I'm guessing. <laughs> I'm, in your, I'm in your debt. Thank you. And I forced Lily to read it. No forcing. No forcing. My God. Like, as if this couldn't have happened at a better time. Peter, did you enjoy my message this morning? Oh, my God. Lily, so I asked Lily to, later in the the pod, we're going to to do a little dive into some really fascinating case studies. And I said, Lily, I want you to prep three. And she sent me 16. (laughs) She's like, uh, which of these do you want me to talk about? (laughs) And I said, one was a definite. Definitely yes. One was a yes, and the remaining thirteen were you choose, and so dealer's so she, choice. I mean, yes. this sung this sung to so many fibers of my being. This book, thank you, Mason. Oh, thank you. That means a lot. That's that's great. So, if I may, just for a moment, is this a fair description of your book, Mason? You do short profiles. I don't know, eight hundred words or so mm-hmm. of of the daily rituals of these great thinkers. It's kind of, and this is said with love, it's in many ways 
the smartest bathroom book you can ever find. Like, yeah, I'll take that as a compliment. I, I've actually heard that a lot. <laughs> it's like a and, good, um, like one great thinker per dump is sort of the way I, I imagine it. All right, that was going a little too far. Now we know. <laughs> now um. we know how like regular Peter is because I don't know. If, I don't know which one equals the other one. If they were shorter, it'd be better. But I think they're the perfect length. And so, what go? What went on? How did this? Ha- how did this wonderful book happen? Um, I I, th- I think it's so sort of fascinating. I have this sense that it sort of started as what it what in the business world would call an MVP, a minimum viable product, a blog. Is that true? Yeah, I mean the the real germ of the project was me. No pun intended. No hey pun now. Intended. Oh germ. Oh no. <laughs> Terrible fun. <laughs> uh, the real beginning was me procrastinating on a writing project. I, um, you know, I've wanted to be a writer for a long time, and I've always been a procrastinator. And in this particular moment, I was working at a magazine in New York, and I had an article due the next morning. I went into the office on a Sunday afternoon to knock this thing out, and I instead was like surfing the internet and slacking off. And um, one of my favorite procrastination techniques is to read about writers' um, daily routines and, mm. and work habits, because I feel like maybe it'll kind of get me in the mood to finally buckle down and get to work. Um, so this particular afternoon, I was reading something, and I thought, you know, somebody should just like collect all these little snippets and anecdotes in one place, like on a blog. And so I did a quick search, and, and there was no blog like that at the time. So instead of writing my article that afternoon, I started this blog just as a hobby. And um, you know, for like a year and a half, I just added things as I ran across them in magazine profiles or obituaries or things I was reading. Um, And then it kind of had this moment where it got linked to from a bunch of sites and kind of blew up, got some attention. And then from that, I was able to turn it into a book deal. And then then I embarked on a much more kind of systematic uh, research process to try to make it book worthy and not just, you know, a printed blog. Mm -hmm. And um, whatever happened with that with that article, did it ever get done? Uh, Yeah, I did get done. I did it the next morning early before work, which is like kind of how I end up doing everything. I don't know why I have to pretend like I'm going to get it done the day before. If I'm really, I kind of know I'm going to just do it the morning of in a last minute panic. So um, yeah, it happened. I have to say that aligns so much with what I was absorbing. As I'm reading it, it felt like I felt the spirit behind Mm. the actual reporting um, or retelling, if you will. And it makes absolute sense that this was inspired out of a space of wanting to create, but not necessarily for the thing that was on deadline. Because mm. I feel like it's a companion piece to Pressfield's The War of Art. Mm. And it's like the ver- the inside job of our own resistance and facing our own resistance, embracing what it is, naming it. And then you're giving us outside examples of how other people either faced it, moved through it, ran through the brick wall. <laughs> <laughs> or let yeah. it succumb, right? Like they they surrendered to it. So, how cool! Oh, thanks. Yeah, I mean, for me, you know, I've always wanted to be a writer, pretty much always, and um, I've always just found it really hard. You know, like like, and I've, so I've always been interested. Like, how did people do it? Even if it wasn't writing, if it was you know being a painter or a composer, like how did they do it on like a really literal day to day basis? Like. How much time did they set aside and how did they force themselves to stick with it when they felt stuck and and blocked? How many hours were they on Twitter? Mm -hmm. There's like a lot of (laughs) questions that we have. So you, how did you go about researching this? I get the sense reading the book. Some of it was diving into biographies. I think one of the cool things is that you read letters, right? This is one of the neat things about these great thinkers. They sent letters to the other great thinkers, their friends, family, and so on. So what was that process like? Yeah, I mean, as much as possible, I wanted to let people speak for themselves in quotes from letters, diaries, journal entries, interviews, because just as much as the actual routines, you know, those were interesting, but the way people talked about their routines was often the really interesting part. You know, the the tone they had, the kind of sense of like comic exasperation, the sort of like melodramatic, tortured artist vibe, like that stuff, or or. Or like the really cheerful, pragmatic, uh, industrious kind of vibe. Like that stuff really kind of gave the book its flavor, I think, more than just the literal details. So yeah, I spent a lot of time at the library, um, just kind of picking my way through whatever I could find. Um, and I mean, at the time I was living in New York, and I would just go to the New York Public Library 
uh, and kind of like I worked my way through the biography section from like A to Z and I would pull things off the shelf and look in the index and look for daily routine, uh, smoking habits, drinking habits, like whatever I felt like might give me a little glimmer of insight. And then a lot of times I didn't find anything, but when I did, I would photocopy it and I just sort of like amassed this uh, trove of like interesting, quirky material. How did you distill or triangulate for truth a letter of the way that someone wanted to be perceived versus mm. the way they really were? Because it's sort of like, if you will, the Instagram of yesteryear is the letter. Oh, everything's great. The mayor just had her cap and I wrote my fourth <laughs> book today. Versus yeah, it's like, definitely... dear Jane, what the fuck? I can't get this out of my, you know what I mean? I can't do anything except write letters. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's definitely some like... Uh, and hold on, hold on, hold on. And is letter writing the procrastination tool <laughs> of the great thinker? <laughs> yeah. Maybe, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, actually, a lot of writers, I feel like, used letter writing to kind of warm up for like the actual writing. They would like write some letters and then they would get down to work on what the novel or whatever. But in terms of... Uh, Taking them at their word, yeah, I mean, you have to take some of this with a grain of salt. I think, you know, like a lot of famous writers and artists are natural myth makers. They like to mm. toy with the sort of self-glorification or, or just um, have fun with interviewers and say, oh, yeah, you know, I smoke like five packs of cigarettes a day and drink a bottle of gin. And so um, I tried. If I could find something that directly contradicted what the person said, I tried to include that and say, actually, this doesn't seem to be true. But sometimes, you know, you just have to let them have their say and, and people can decide for themselves. Mason, one of the things that I like about the book is you use the word ritual. I think that's a special word. It's a word I've talked about in previous podcast episodes. Peter loves the word ritual. I do love that word ritual. And I that like it. That sounded you know, sardonic or judgy. It's not at all. I'm like, <laughs> yes. I underlined and I bolded for audio. Uh, hey, well, part of the reason I have Lily on here is she makes fun of me sometimes. Uh, so it's okay. <laughs> I like the word ritual because, you know, really we're talking in many ways about habits. And, and I believe habits are sort of a cheat code to winning in the world. You know, we think about willpower all the time and powering through. And Lily was talking about Pressfield, the war of art. Pressfield talks about how difficult it is to, to make things. And, um, and one of the ways that you can make things is just to make the making automatic. So in my mm -hmm. world of creating more than you, than you consume, uh, this idea of a ritual is great because it really is a habit, but it's really, it feels like a special habit. You know, like you don't talk about rituals, my workout ritual. And so, so to me, there's something about this creation process. My own particular, if you were, if you were ever to, you're going to outlive me, Mason, you know, to, to look back on, on great thinkers of the 20, what is it called? The 2020s. You'll talk about Peter would go to a cafe and he would, uh, he'd have a cappuccino and that signaled that the work day is starting. And there's something about starting the day with this delicious drink. And the reason I started drinking cappuccinos actually had to do with something very similar to your start of this project, which was, this is a dozen years ago now, I decided, boy, if I don't get my writing together, I am going to lose my job as a professor. I'm not going to get tenure. And so what I did was I just started researching what do great writers do? And I was reading all the books, the Stephen King book and so on and so forth. And I found a blog post that did sort of, it was sort of a survey. Shoot, you might've written it, who knows, about um, what are the constants across great writers? And one of them was they tend to write first thing in the morning and they have a cup of coffee to start the day. I was approaching 40 and didn't drink coffee. I had caffeine once as a graduate student in five years. Was that because you were a Mormon? <laughs> no, I just was like, I actually was good about getting enough sleep. And so, um, and I, you know, I just didn't like coffee. I didn't want to drink soda, of course. And so I start, I was what like, I of guess. Of course, who are you? You grew, we grew up in the same planet at the same time. Who are, I'm, a, what? I'm a weirdo in some ways, I know. Is I know. that connected to why you don't, you choose not to really drink now? Yeah, a little bit of just about sort Mason, of clean. Mason, we'll get back to you in a second. <laughs> Peter. <laughs> have, a, have a sip of coffee, Mason. Lily and I have a, a side conversation. Hey, we're going to work this out. <laughs> and, and so I was just like, all right, well, if I want to be a great writer, let me just behave like great writers. And um, I didn't want a cup of coffee, and so I would have a little espresso. That would be my thing. And then, of course, like many things, like 
wine and whiskey and other other types of consumables, I started to like it. And I actually now drink the cappuccino less for the caffeine and more for the ritual even still. Yeah, so I, I'm curious for both of you, actually, that your word ritual was chosen carefully, I assume. And then, and then Lily, do you have rituals, you know, related to your creative work? Those are, that's a two-part question. One of you can go first, not at the same time. I'll tell you a secret, actually, to start. Um, the working title for the book was always Daily Routines. And when I was compiling it, I was thinking about people's routines, like the sort of structure they gave their day. Because I was interested in how, you know, like if you look at someone's routine, you kind of get a sense of their priorities, you know, like what you do every day ends up being like what you do with your life. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, the book was done. And then like literally, I think when I saw the draft of the my publisher's book catalog, they changed the title <laughs> to Daily Rituals. <laughs> I was like, wait. Ah. Uh, and my editor was like, it's like, it's really, it's a better title. And I think actually you are writing about rituals. And I was really resistant to it because I felt like, you know, rituals have a sort of religious context that has a sort of um, not maybe even like magical kind of connotation. Mm -hmm. And um, it wasn't what I was thinking about. But since then, I've come to feel like it's actually, it may, you know, I think it was a better title. And I think it is a more interesting um, framework because I think rituals, you know, you asked about the difference between a ritual and like a habit. And I think the thing is like a ritual is about transformation. You know, it's, it, it, it's about... You know, a habit is just something you do, you know, you got to get to the gym, you kind of put it on autopilot, it becomes easier because it's a habit. I feel like a ritual is like you're kind of walking yourself step by step into a particular frame of mind or state of mind. So for these artists, you're trying to get into this um, headspace where you can do this kind of slippery, fragile, demanding work. So that's where I think people do things like you, where you have to have the particular cup of coffee at the particular time in the particular way. It's sort of, you're, you're sort of like training yourself to access the state of mind that otherwise can be really difficult to get into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I and absolutely dovetails into what I was going to say, which I think is the difference between habit and ritual is consciousness. And yeah. how do you engage with purpose in this activity? And I have a, a dear friend who is a ritual witch. She will <laughs> ritualize everything anything she she drinks coffee and tea i mean i'm just kidding well she does probably but like when she's when she has a tea bag depending on whether or not she wants to call something in or l have something leave her spirit her her life her consciousness she will rotate the tea bag in different directions depending on hmm. i mean that's wow. someone who makes everything important and i will say for me i'm only I th uh, thank you, 2020. Um, it was a year ago today I arrived in my new state of mind, of actual location. My GPS coordinates completely changed a year ago. And then this uh, pandemic hit. I don't know if you've heard about it, but I had to stay here. And that changed everything about me because I went from being a solo who diversified her joy and all of her jobs and income and everything to all of a sudden being stuck, frozen, literally in Minnesota with family and surrounded by so many people and being a creative who does a little bit of everything and is uh, inspired by so many different things. It really forced me to start ritualizing my own consciousness and at some point you know it gets really dark it's like sundown 3 30 4 o'clock here and I'm from Malibu and I was like oh girl how am I gonna survive this mm -hmm. and something clicked when I was like you know it's one thing if I'm going to rehearsal because it's like what a seven o'clock call the sun's gone down or when I was a kid and I played sports in high school and playing soccer and the sun went down early but I was still alert and I was still engaged so then I started thinking, okay, when the sun goes down, what I'm going to do is take a walk around my apartment building and pretend like I'm going somewhere to then start the third act of my day. And that completely shifted my mindset. I didn't need my nap. <laughs> you know what I mean? I didn't need to go to bed by six o'clock. And so I do feel like ritual is something that as a creative, as a human, I think it's important to do. But then to ritualize your activities absolutely sets you up for success. Do you have a particular tea bag swirling activity, cappuccino sipping activity that comes to mind, Lily, that you've cultivated? 
Yeah, I have, I do fatty coffee in the morning and now I have this really great vacuum sealed mug. So I put my things in the mug. I walk, don't take the elevator, down from my sixth floor apartment down to the free Starbucks machine in our lobby. And the path that I take changes almost every day, but it's like as I shake my mug full of coffee with all this butter and MCT oil and all that, I'm like calling in the things I want. I'm I not joking. It. Yeah. I love that's that too. Great. That's wonderful. This oh, is I what I want say. for my day. <laughs> <laughs> that's really, I, that's really cool. I wanted to say, um, I rem- remembered once reading that the, uh, there's a Turkish novelist named, um, Orhan Pamuk who wrote a novel called Snow that was like, uh, widely praised maybe like 10 years ago. And he, I read an interview with him where he said he went through a period where he was living with like his partner and he had a really hard time getting into the headspace to write. So every morning he would get up, get dressed, get his briefcase, go out the front door, walk around the block and then come right back in and go straight to his desk and go to work as if he were, you know, literally going to his office and entering a different space. So you have, um, you're in good company with that one. Yes. I I made a joke about how I was like, shit, I need to light candles, grab my yoga mat, run around my apartment building, run back into my apartment and go, sorry, 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 sorry. (laughs) That kind of stuff makes a difference though, doesn't it? I mean, that's the thing that's so interesting. It's like, I don't really know why it works that way, but it does seem to be the way our brains work. And um, yeah, it's, 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 that's why it's so fun to read these stories. You know, for me doing this research for the book was a joy because, um, I just find this material like endlessly fascinating. So every time you find somebody's little thing, you think, yes, this is so good. I can't wait to get this in here, you know? Yeah, a little gem. Yeah, and the, and the book's filled with those. As a quick aside, Lily's um, joke there is an inside joke for, for some because if you've never taken a yoga class, what you don't realize is how stressful it is to get to yoga on time and set up so then you can then relax. And, yeah. uh, you know, and so... So I find yoga classes stress me out for that reason oftentimes. It's like the first 20 minutes of you being like, just relax, you're here, your survival, <laughs> you like, your, your reptilian you're, brain is like, you fucked up the way. <laughs> yeah, they'll lock you out if you're late, you know, so not to disturb others. Yeah. Okay, so so we're, we want to talk about solitude, of course. And so why, in your experience, Mason, my reading of the book is mu- many of these people did exactly what we were talking about find some peace and quiet, find a separate space and, and do work in that. And then before we get to the benefits of that, the other thing that they did was they would release themselves from that ritual and engage in exercise or social time or partying or something like that, that very little was it the case that, that you describe someone who got up at six in the morning and worked until 10 p.m. at night and then went to bed, rinse and repeat. These people regularly had, in, in my book, Stick to Business, I, I talk about they work hard or hardly work, right? They grind and then they release themselves from that grind. Can, before we get into the depth of the, of, the, of the grind, can we talk about that release, that hardly working stage? Yeah, I mean, uh, that reminds me of a quote about the 19th century French novelist uh, Balzac, who wrote like dozens and dozens of novels. And um, his biographer said that he worked in um, orgies of work followed by orgies of relaxation and pleasure. So when he was working, he was one of these people who worked from like six in the morning until 10 at night and slept and then just started over again. But then when he wasn't working, you know, he was completely uh, having a good time. Um, I think there's that tension or that balance in a lot of these lives. You know, it's like, you need that solitude to really burrow into your work and dig into it and experiment and, um, you know, do trial and error and start over again and just let yourself kind of wallow in it. And, um, but you also need a release from that. You need some experience of the world and other people. You, you know, I think we've all had the experience of being too much in our own heads and that can be a problem, um, for any kind of creative activity. So, um, yeah, you see a lot of people who crave solitude, but then at night they have to get out and go to a restaurant or a bar or have dinner with their friends. Yeah, it feels like um, the natural rhythm of expansion and contraction. And it's like you can only absorb so many uh, you know, new things before you have to squeeze that sponge out into your writing and I will say that uh, as I as I'm currently stepping into uh, my voice as a solo writer, because I've been working with other people, it's 
kind of amazing how I'm like, oh, no, I should have been doing this mm-hmm. so much sooner because I've been hearing everybody. So when I'm still I'm still corked up a little bit and it's taking a little bit to punch through to hear what my voice is versus the voices of so many around me. And because we now have so many more options of stimuli with story, it's, you know, social media, it's all the news channels, it's people around us. If you live in cities, whatnot, right? It's just Mm -hmm. so much that like you really have to commit to your solitude. And even in the artist way, right? Julia Cameron has us like going through reading deprivation, which is the best as you showed. Mason, the best way to procrastinate from putting your own voice onto paper is to take in other voices. Yeah, no, it's great. <laughs> that's like my that's my career in a nutshell. Um, uh, yeah, I really think finding that balance is tricky, and it changes from project to project and from time to time in your life, you know. And um, I also think some people want to get that balance um, in a daily way, like they want to work a certain amount during a day and then they want to socialize a certain amount. And I think other people do it more in a being in the project and then being out of the project. Mm-hmm. So you have people who are in project mode and they're obsessed with their project and they 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 want to cancel all their lunches. They don't want to hang out. They, they do whatever they can to just kind of like push away competing obligations. And then when it's over, they might not really work at all for weeks or months or, you know, barely work. And um, so... I don't know if that's two personality types or just kind of changes that in different, you know, phases of people's careers. Yeah. I think um, Lily works in Hollywood and the Hollywood model is sort of, you work for weeks on end, long ass days, and then you disappear, you know, on vacation and people can't even get a hold of you for a month. Um, that's completely different than my world, which is I work almost every single day, but I try to find a little bit of joy in that day, but it could be on a weekly schedule. You know, the average person who's Monday through Friday, nine to five has their weekends or their Sabbath, you know, in strict to business, I interview an improviser named Billy Merritt and Billy Merritt talks about how to become a great improviser. And, and he goes through like, you know, on Monday night, you take your class on Tuesday night, you drop into an improv jam on uh, Wednesday night, you go watch improv on Thursday, you hire an instructor and you work with your team. And, and, you know, on Friday, you go see other types of comedy, you know, like this kind of thing. And on the weekend, you go to Europe, is what he says, <laughs> right? Sounds and great. He, he doesn't mean go to Europe for a weekend. He means metaphorically go to Europe, right? Is you do anything but improv, and that thing should be like going to Europe. That is, it's going to expose you to new ideas and, and give you material to improvise or to write and, and, and so on. And I think that, that that ends up becoming really critical. So let's talk about these about this solitude, right? So you you mentioned trial and error. You try, mentioned this sort of idea of experimentation. Can you can you say more about that? What is it that's so special about solitude? This is a series on solitude, and so what's so special about that time that that enhances the creative process? I mean, I just think it lets you go deeper into your own thoughts and also be more free with them and not have to worry about um, there's, there's something about being interrupted, taking you out of it that prevents you, I think, from following an idea as far as you could. Um, and like, also, you know, like as a writer, I can write something really bad, which is how most things start. And nobody has to the, see it, you know, the like, shitty I'll, first draft. Yeah, I'll yes. write it and then I'll just delete it or I'll file it away. But like, my my book's not just about writers, it's also about painters and choreographers and composers. And like, if you're composing something at the piano, like you have to make the notes. I mean, and if you're working at a <laughs> work of choreography and thinking about the movements, like you have to do that. And I think, um, you know, like people need solitude just to experiment and not feel watched and judged. Mm-hmm. And I mean, even as a writer, sometimes I feel like if someone's in the same space, you know, you're a little bit on guard. You have a little sense of someone there, a sense of maybe judgment or being watched. And like, it's just, it just takes a little bit to kind of keep you from going all the way into the work or all the way into an idea. Well, and, and even the examples you're giving are still collaborative arts. If I'm writing a piece of music, if, unless it's only going to be me and that one instrument, 
you're if you're composing, you're composing for a future collaboration with others who are going to inform what the actual form is, right? Dancing, unless you are the choreographer and the solo dancer. And same thing with writing, right? You write the first draft, you write the draft, you write whatever you're willing to then give your editor. But it ends up being a collaboration, yet it takes the commitment and courage for solitude for you to get that out so you can start with something. It's the it's the improv of like, just get out there, put your body in space, take up space, take a shape and say something. And then we'll build the universe around you. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I really think that's don't... a really good point. Please. Oh, I was just gonna say, I think a lot of even collaborative uh, art practices often really begin in solitude. I mean, I, I did some research on choreographers who, of course, work collaboratively. I mean, they're literally working with dancers, helping dancers find the dance. And so many of them actually talked about how they had to have first a long stretch of solitude to like work out the ideas by themselves, like cl locked away. Um, there's a great story about Martha Graham, you know, one of the great choreographers of all time. She moved to Greenwich Village in the 1920s. It was like this hotbed of intellectual artistic activity. Everybody was hanging out. And her response was like, no, I stay in my studio. Like, I don't hang out because if I go hang out, we're going to talk. And like talking is not doing. And like she has this quote I have it in front of me. Talk is a privilege and one must deny oneself that privilege. And it was like. She had uh -oh. to Hold, be please. alone. Having that tattooed to the inside <laughs> of my eyelid. You guys, no, you guys keep going. I'll be fine. I'll, I'll, I can still talk. I don't need to. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I mean, and there uh, same thing with. Um, there's another uh, choreographer who's not as famous today, named Agnes DeMille. Um, she kind of pioneered, like I think she did Oklahoma, this kind of like really American style of like dance, and um, uh, she has a really entertaining autobiography, and she talks about how like she would lock herself in the studio and like she couldn't be observed when she was doing the early stages. And then when it was time to work with the dancers, she would still, she would actually station a guard in front of the rehearsal studio because like, you know, still nobody could observe them beyond the absolute, you know, people that had to be in the room. So that's a common theme. I, I don't know why it is, but there's something about, you know, you can't it's get process. the full freedom. Yeah. It's yeah. absolute process. Well, I, I can give you one little tip about this. First of all, I want to say this. I really want any violinist, pianist, electric guitarist to work out new ideas in private. The world <laughs> doesn't need to hear. Doesn't need to hear the early stuff. Spoken uh, as a man who lives in an apartment building. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is, so there's actually really fascinating research about the costs and benefits of a crowd. And one of the things that's interesting, so when it comes to peak performance, um, what ends up happening is the novice wilts in front of a crowd and the expert performs better in front of the crowd. And, there, and so there is, so it's very clear that, that others matter, even accepting others. And, and we know this because we know that brainstorming works best when people brainstorm their ideas alone and then hand them in versus when they brainstorm them in front of other people because they will self-censor in order to not be judged. And so, so that's, an, I think, that idea of the freedom to experiment, the freedom to be bad, the freedom to be wrong. And really what we know about creative processes is that it's typically not your first idea that's the best one, and that sometimes you happen into good ideas through bad ideas, um, and, and so on, you know, with, with, with regard to that. Uh, it's so fun to hear this, uh, to hear you talk about this kind of stuff, because... I just think that the, that people can disinhibit us. Look, it's already hard enough to make something and know that you're going to, you know, to, to use Seth Godin's term, ship it. You know what I mean? To to because you know your people are gonna gonna dislike it. And actually, the mo more provocative, in some ways, the better it is. The more um, haters. Yes, and especially in the arts, like one of the really fascinating things to do, and, and Mason, st feel free to steal this for your next book idea, <laughs> is a review of reviews of world-changing art. Right, so... Um, oh, I love that I idea. <laughs> right? Isn't that great? Like it's You sort actually of get a little bit of that if you read the reviews on Amazon. All those, all those like five star or zero star reviews of your favorite movies or your favorite <laughs> yeah. books. Yes. I mean, there is some There's not some genius there. happening. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Or, or reviews of, of national parks. 
One of my favorite is, is one star <laughs> reviews of the Grand Canyon. Like, <laughs> my God. So, but you know, I, I think I, I saw an interview. I did see an interview. It was in a, um, the, the, it was a really wonderful, fun documentary about electric guitar called It Might Get Loud. Ooh. And Jimmy Page talks about one of their albums that they released that has like, it's, you know, it just has hit after hit after hit. And there were these short, fiery critiques of it and is and you know what he just said is he said the critics didn't get it you know the critics didn't get it and so mm -hmm. i i think that we already are battling as creative people the concerns about how we'll be judged in the world it's part of the reason i was reluctant to to launch this podcast and um and then it's even harder as you're making it in the moment worried that someone's like eh, i don't know lily you're being a little too bold there maybe mm -hmm. you should just tamp it down a tiny bit well, and isn't that about who's your audience? And what's what the privilege of modern day is that we, our audience can be global, right? It's the blessing and the curse. Mm -hmm. But for so many of these people, you're talking about hundreds of years ago, and they don't know who their audience is. And some of them didn't even get an audience in, until they died. So that's the true test of the artist is are you willing to take up space and put yourself out in whatever light either sunshine or you know the century light on a stage and cast whatever fucking shadow you end up casting but not stay in the analysis of shadow and still keep going still try to find the new light cast a new shadow a new shadow but if you blend in there's no shadow mm -hmm. we had a previous mm -hmm. episode we looked at nietzsche and his view on friends you know, Nietzsche is a pretty big deal these days, but not when he was publishing books. The blessings of being a great artist is that you may change the world and you may be remembered forever, but you may not do it in your lifetime. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, another thing I want to say is like, I think a lot of artists are really above all else chasing. They're trying to satisfy themselves. You know, I mean, they think about their audience, but at, at, when they're really making the work, it's like there's some idea or ideal some effect they're trying to create that they can't quite define, but it's like they know it when they see it or when they land on it. And it's like that also is where you really, really need to just be alone with yourself. You know, like it, it takes so little to take you out of that. So even if you're not thinking about being judged by the audience or being, you know, witnessed by someone in the room, it's like having someone in the room just keeps you from going that far into your own thing. Um, I think there's a quote, there's this great, painter Agnes Martin who lived in New Mexico in order to like in kind of remote New Mexico in order to have like more solitude for herself and she said um something like your mind is not your own when there are other people around you know like it, it's right. true like just the presence of another person shifts your mind a little bit or keeps your mind from shifting into that other space or at least that's kind of how I feel that is a thousand percent why I am not looking for a partner right now as I'm honing my creative voice. Mm -hmm. And yeah. by the way, 50% of American adults who are single are not interested in dating or a relationship. So you are completely normal in not wanting that at this yeah. time and then using that time, as I always like to say, to, to hone. So Agnes Martin also wrote, you must gather together in your studio all of your sensibilities and when they are gathered, you must not be disturbed. So, yeah. so she went to New Mexico to get away from people, and then she would go into her studio and get away yeah. from people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, she was, solitude. she was ruthless. Yeah, I mean, there's, yes. a great, there's a great book of her work, um, and it has this little, like, a facsimile of a little handwritten booklet she made. So it's like you get to see her handwriting in pencil on this notepaper, and the booklet is all about inspiration. She was a big believer in inspiration, and in particular... Not like inspiration was something that just like hit you out of the blue. It was something you had to cultivate. You had to mm -hmm. make the right conditions. You had to like be there for it every day. And above all, you had to be alone with your thoughts. You had to cultivate solitude. And she talked about you can't be an artist without a studio. She said you can't. You have Which to have a studio and you have to be able to close the door. And if someone can come in, it doesn't count. And that sort of echoed in Maya Angelou's needing of her own apartment, right? It's sort of like instead of getting an office, she got an apartment. Yeah, she said like, I, yeah, she said like I can't work at home because it like throws me. You know, like, she um, I, th I think she said she'd like to get a motel or hotel room, and it was like the tinier and the meaner the better. You know, like and and there's a great quote where she said she would surround herself with a Bible, a deck of cards, a bottle of sherry, and 
Oh, I'm forgetting the last one. I think a dictionary. You know, it was like this, this just the f- absolute basics. <laughs> and then she would go there all day. And then she would come home and see her husband and have like a normal kind of like evening. But um, she couldn't write without that other space to really be alone. All right. So here's what I want to do, because people are sitting here going, you're finally talking about some of these great thinkers, <laughs> you know, like talk about the longest cold open of, um, of a <laughs> podcast. Uh, so what I want to do is turn things over to the two of you to to let's talk about some of the sort of notable creative thinkers who sort of use solitude in interesting ways. And let's highlight some of those who um, who were single. Right. So many of these people, this was during a time where almost everybody got married. So um, so my guess is part of the reason they needed the solitude was because there was someone else in their life that they had to get away from. And so, but there are some that were, that were solo at the time. And my guess is that many of them were sort of solo by mentality. Anyways, they just had to marry because that's what you did. So who wants to start? I'll say I really love, um, there are two, there's two moments in the book. One is about Nathaniel Hawthorne. And when he was first starting out as a writer after college, he um, spent 12 years working on his writing. He, he basically shut himself in his room and he read obsessively and he wrote a bunch and then he destroyed most of what he wrote. And then finally he came out with his first book of short stories. And critics have called those years the solitary years. That's mm. like a period of Hawthorne's career, the solitary years. And then fast forward 100 years and there's this great... <laughs> Also, term for Samuel Beckett, living in Paris, went through a similar similar phase where he was trying to get his writing to the next level, and he stayed alone in his room and read obsessively and wrote a bunch and destroyed most of what he wrote. And they call that period the siege in the room. <laughs> I just love mm. I just love that the critics have made up these terms for these phases, these phases of like solitary, head down, kind of tortured, um, super dedicated, like solo writing. Um, so I always think of the siege in the room when I'm trying to do something, you know, tricky. <laughs> it, it, it does. It is so interesting. It's like the press field, the, you know, the war of art, right? Like you are doing battle in order to create this thing. And then in the, on the complete flip, you have Patricia Highsmith who fed her id like that was her job. Right. Like eat, eats all the food that tastes delicious, bacon, <laughs> fried eggs, any time of the day. doesn't matter. Her favorite cereal. She's got like drinks whenever she wants. Um, she wanted to avoid discipline and like was focused on pleasure as a source of her inspiration. I mean, talk about turning your solitude into play and fun. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, also because she found the writing so difficult, it was like she had to comfort herself. So she would sit on the bed and she had like, it was something like she had a donut and a cup of coffee. And then she also had like a saucer of sugar to dip the donut in. It was like yes, really... because yeah. that's exactly what you do when your id gets to be in charge. <laughs> if I may, there was these two paths to being creative. And so, so one is the Samuel Beckett path, which is just, you just keep hammering on something over and over again, and eventually something good comes out of it. And then the other one is, tell me again who this was? Patricia Highsmith, who would collect snails. Patricia Highsmith, (laughs) which is the, which is to make good things you need to feel good. That is the positive emotion enhances creativity. And that's very nice. I like this idea that there's not one way to do it. And yet both of them embrace solitude. In yeah, because the reality is the only reason why, you're even, why we are even talking about these artists is because of their proof of productivity, mm-hmm. what they ended up creating. They landed planes, you know, as opposed to the, all of the ideas that they had in their heads when they passed. We'll never know what those ideas were, right? And so everybody created something that was of note. It's, it's just kind of amazing. We get really connected to the how they got there. Macy, who else do you have? Let's see. Well, I was thinking about Georgia O'Keeffe recently. You know, she's another, actually, like Agnes Martin, who we mentioned, she went to New Mexico to really be alone uh, with her work. And um, actually, I have in front of me a little description that she gave an interviewer in the 60s about her morning um, that I think captures it nicely. She said, um, I like to get up when the dawn comes. The dogs start talking to me, and I like to make a fire and maybe some tea and then sit in bed and watch the sun come up. The morning is the best time. There are no people around. 
my pleasant disposition likes the world with nobody in it. And I think that is, you know, kind of a common refrain. Like uh, some of these people, their equilibrium required solitude. Their creativity required it. But maybe beyond that, um, it was something they craved at a, at a deeper level. And um, mm. so, yeah, George O'Keefe is a good example of that. So are you saying that the person who needs people around may be at a disadvantage in some ways? I'm saying that, like, you have to figure out a working process or practice that suits your temperament. So there are people who, like Kate Chopin, the the author, said that she would write with her children, quote, swarming about her. Like, she didn't care. She would just, like, sit in the living room and she'd write and she'd have kids everywhere and dogs and, like, um, and that worked for her. But other people felt like they needed that solitude and so they arranged their lives to, to, to have it, to make it. So I think it's about um, knowing what, you need and then kind of arranging your life and your day in particular to access that. Or the flip is F. F. Scott Fitzgerald, who somehow was able to write while being enlisted in the army. And then the second that he was in, in control of his schedule, couldn't get anything done. Yeah, I know that story's kind of heartbreaking. (laughs) He was so so productive. (laughs) And then he lost the thread of it. I mean, Fitzgerald's alcoholism is definitely like something. This is a short blurb that can't really get into it, but I think that might have been one of the factors. Um, But yeah, he also like he was swept up in, you know, the roaring 20s. And um, I think there are writers who like hanging out is so great. (laughs) And they're part of such a scene that like who wants to like tie yourself to the desk for eight hours a day? And, and at the time, writers were rock stars. Mm. You you have to remember that, right? That that essentially is the case. And it's a lot more fun to talk about writing than it is to write. And it's a lot more fun to talk about writing over over beers or or cocktails. And who knows to... how many attempts at his sequel, or not the sequel, but like the second book, he was in the middle of, but then had that resistance and drank himself mm-hmm, into mm-hmm. numbness. Whereas, I mean, the... yeah. I was just going to say, the other tricky part is like, but who's to say the period of not writing wasn't productive in its own way? You know what I mean? Like so many great books come out of the spell of dissolution, procrastination. Uh, You know, you learn something about yourself. Maybe you learn about your demons or overcome your demons. Um, I think sometimes the writers who crank out a book every year, you maybe wish they would get stuck get blocked for yes. five years and then they'd produce their best work. You know, I, it's like, like, you know, whose marriage I wonder about Stephen King's <laughs> guess who's not wait, guess who's not having tons of sex. The guy who's writing like six books a year, you know? Yeah. He writes like, what is it? A thousand or 2000 words every day. And I think including his birthday and Christmas morning. <laughs> it's like, I'm like, this is, I don't want to fuck that guy. He's so regimented. <laughs> That's literally, oh no. no. Um, you know, I, yeah, I think, I think F. Scott Fitzgerald gets, catches too much hell. Cause think about, you know, talk about what one of the world's best one hit wonders, you know, like, mm. let's, uh, let's be honest, you know, you write a near well, perfect although, book. Yeah, yeah, Gatsby, although Tender is the Night, the f- I think that's the next book is Yeah, two, two hit wonders, yeah. excuse me, yes. Yeah, so, that's um, fair. I mean, yeah, I mean, but yeah, it's true, wouldn't you rather produce Gatsby and nothing else than produce, you know, whatever, 30 books? Because you get judged on your winners, and ultimately, anyways, you know, I think that that's uh, so. Either either path works, you know. I think the thing is, can you? Um, I like to think my best book is ahead of me. I hope it is. <laughs> it's, it's the way. It's the that's the only way to think about these things. I think like you have to believe that, right? Like otherwise, why stick with it? So then you're a little bit more like an Ernest Hemingway, Peter, in that like you'll show up to the page every day. And I loved his, I loved what he did, his practice of finishing just when you know exactly what's going to happen next and like moving away from it so that when you sat down the next day, you were full with the idea and that was your like initial offering and then you just added. Can you say more about um, about Hemingway's uh, process, Lily? And I, I want to highlight this. Um, Hemingway showed up per, um in one of the previous episodes with Mary Dom, in which we look at people who should never have married. Um, so Hemingway married many times. And I think what we decided was maybe he should have just stuck with his first wife, if I remember mm. correctly. But um, but what was his process like? I mean, you know, it's really impressive, right? Talk about someone who, 
who would grind and release. Boy, when that guy released, he really released. <laughs> <laughs> but he did it every day. He did, but he also would get up and work every day, yeah. Well, and I will say that, like, maybe not for the prop, the process, not the direct answer to your question about the process, but I love the quote of him writing, what is it? A, the letters that he would write were mm-hmm. an, a welcome break from the awful responsibility of writing, or then sometimes called the responsibility of awful writing. Right, exactly. <laughs> the pain, it's like you just have to keep doing, it's sort of like working out because yeah. you know if I don't go today, then my legs will be sore and then I won't be able to recover and then I'm not going to show up for myself in three days. So I just I just have to do it. Mm-hmm. Mason, what was? Mm-hmm. What, how would you describe Hemingway's process? Was there something special about it beyond that? I mean, I think he does something that a lot of writers and artists do, which is like plant the seed and let it percolate. Like the thing Lily mentioned about like he he would stop when he knew it was next. And then so the next morning when he went to the page, he knew exactly where he was going to pick up. And um, but it, like the real magic of that was like that whole 24 hours, the thing he left in the back of his mind kind of is like, you know, your brain kind of gnaws away at it and, and expands on it. So it's like, I think by the time he got back to the page, he had not just the next sentence, but all this 24 hours worth of thought and rumination and percolation uh, to kind of put into it. Personal question, Mason, because that's a little bit like um, Frank Lloyd Wright, Mm. uh, who, and and I'm wondering where like you, Frank Lloyd Wright and Ernest Hemingway, there's a trifecta there as far, (laughs) Ernest Hemingway is showing up every day and clearly doesn't have a procrastination, uh, I don't want to say problem, challenge, right? Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. the F, uh, the the um, Frank Lloyd Wright of it, where you're percolating on something so that when you do sit down and the pressure of an appointment is there, of a deadline, is when all of it comes out. Like, are you yeah. percolating? Hold on. I don't remember the, the Frank Lloyd Wright one. And people haven't read the book yet. Oh, that's so. right. That's what, right. What, Sorry was, to be the cool kid at the party. Just, <laughs> I feel like I just who just name dropped Frank Lloyd Wright. Oh, this bitch over here by the champagne flute. <laughs> yeah, the the gist of the Frank Lloyd Wright is that like he would drive. You know, he was an architect. He had an office of uh, architects that worked for him, and like he would drive them nuts because he wouldn't do the drawings he work for a project. In front of them. Yeah, he wouldn't. I mean, he. He would do it in his head, but then like he would wait until literally like the meeting was like an hour away and then he would like knock out the drawing to show the client. I mean, like Falling Water is the most famous residence of the 20th century, you know, like everyone makes a pilgrimage to Falling Water. Like he literally didn't start the drawings for that until the guy, the client called him and said, I'm getting in the car and I'm going to be there in like two hours. And so, um, but that I think actually is such a good, I'm glad you asked that because I think so many good creative products are the result of exactly that dynamic. It's like the percolation, the letting something uh, be in the back of your mind, letting your mind kind of gnaw away at it. Um, And then the really super focused burst of work, you know what I mean? Like it's like, it's, it's the rumination and then the deadline pressure making it into something. I think that's like the ideal in a lot of ways. Okay, this triangle, because I, I, I want this to be crystal clear to people. So who are the three sides of this triangle or the three corners? So Mason began our story today talking about how this book came out of needing a deadline mm-hmm. and, and, and really butting up against it and how Mason has this recurring experience of what some might call procrastination. Frank Lloyd Wright was looked at as someone who procrastinated – when really he might not have been in action uh, in his development of an idea, but was but was internally working on it. Same as what Mason's probably doing so that when he did sit down, he could actually write it out. And then you've got Ernest Hemingway, who who does show up to the page every day. However, he consciously deprives himself of work mm-hmm. so that he can percolate. He values the percolation time. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. really wonderfully said. It reminds me of a story. There's a guy, I, I met him on Twitter. He has a famous talk. He's a designer. He's a famous talk called Fuck You, Pay Me. <laughs> and it, and it's, a, it's a manifesto for designers to get paid what they deserve to be paid. Yes, creatives in general. It, it's great. And he's, he talks about how... Um, a client says, well, it only took you an hour to do that. Why are you charging me for 23 hours of work? And he said, 
that's because I needed the 22 hours to get to that hour of work. And, and yes. I think, I think that's a nice example for Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, he yes, may work yes. an hour, but he needed those other, those other 22 well, plus hours. And, and let's also, you know, let's also be mindful of the fact that like if, down to the studio musician who gets hired to be in the room while some amazing artist comes through and is working for hours on their vocals and the studio musician just keeps doing their thing and they have a base rate of payment, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and and yet everyone's like touting whoever it is that's the lead singer, but that that person put in so many hours to get to the point where they could be consistent and good. Mm-hmm. So while you're only paying technically for the time that you're in the studio, you need to value the person for the the journey that got them here. In mm-hmm. my opinion, because me showing up and being able to like bust out a script, even though you gave six hours of a studio time, but I did it in an hour, is mm-hmm. because I'm good at what I do. Yeah. So that doesn't mean that I shouldn't get paid for the bigger picture. Yeah. Hey, so can we go back to talking about some of these amazing artists who were single and solo? Yeah, sure. I mean, one who jumps out to me is the writer Franz Kafka, who um, is one of my favorite writers, and in particular, one of my favorites to read about the creative process. His diaries are just like full, really rich in the ups and downs, and particularly the downs of trying to make it as a writer. And um, there's a section in there where he lists the pros and cons of marriage, um, because he's considering marrying his fiance, and they end up breaking it off. But anyway, uh, item number three on his pro-con list. Good for Kafka. Good for Kafka. (laughs) It's a a whole total debacle. You feel so sorry for him and his fiance if you read the whole saga. Um, Anyway, item number three on the summary of all the arguments for and against my marriage is I must be alone a great deal. What I accomplished was only the result of being alone. And um, he said elsewhere that um, like a writer can never be alone enough. And like he, he even had a fantasy of like the ideal setup for a writer was to be like have a room in some basement of a building and just have somebody like leave a meal outside your door twice a day. <laughs> Otherwise, just be completely. <laughs> That's like, called that prison. Was the fantasy. That's, <laughs> we call I that mean, prison. I just have to say, how how long were they dating? Because this is not a guy who ever there's no who's this woman and what did she end up doing? Because it's it's such a sad tale. No, it's really these are it's red really flags. Terrible. I'm just saying yeah. these are red well, flags. Have you read Kafka's? Stories like no, I'm, uh, he doesn't. What? <laughs> Why would I read Kafka? I, it's me. Ah, this is not. This read. is tell not. The, to read. This is not the happy lo- go lucky kind of guy who has the joy, <laughs> creates a joyous family. So was his fiance like the Wednesday Adams of their time? <laughs> no. Who no, is she, was... she? Do we know her name? Let's find yeah. her. Can we Google her? Or <laughs> yeah. Bing her? Let's Bing her. <laughs> Let's Yahoo her. It's Felice, F-E-L-I-C-E, Bauer, B-A-U-E-R. Felice okay. Bauer. Poor Felice. So this is a nice contrast, or at least a good segue into the last couple of things I want to talk about. One of the things that you have done, and you have a, a really delightful New Yorker article about this, about artists who are in a relationship and the, and the tensions that that creates in terms of making their art. And this seems especially the case for people who live in small apartments. Am I, am I remembering this correctly? Well, yeah. I mean, when the pandemic started and people were being forced to shelter at home, I, you know, my wife and I were going through this. We were both in our one bedroom apartment working from home. And, um, you know, like I started thinking about all the artists and writers who have been in that kind of situation and how they tried to create some sort of separation in order to do their work. There's a, um, there's a great quote by the Elizabeth, uh, the poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning, who said, um, an artist must, I fancy, either find or make a solitude to work in if it's going to be good work at all. And so the mm-hmm. idea with, the, with this article was like, how did people, quote, make a solitude when they didn't actually have the luxury of solitude? Um, so it ranges from the most rudimentary tactics to the most kind of like elaborate ones. And the most rudimentary is like the painters, um, Willem de Kooning and Elaine de Kooning, who were married, uh, had this tiny studio in New York and there wasn't even a wall separating their painting spaces. So they had like a rule. They would at least they would 
be in opposite corners and like face away from each other. Oh, I <laughs> that see. was the best they could do. And then Willem de Kooning was like, it turns out, a great whistler. He loved to whistle while he worked. And so this drove Elaine absolutely mad. And he ended up having to get a separate studio because it didn't work, even though they couldn't afford it. Um, and then he so invented that- the iPod. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking noise canceling earphones are this. Yeah. Sort of, yeah, the luxuries we have now, I know. And then at the more kind of like elaborate side, you have um, there, there's this couple uh, artists, Romaine Brooks, who was a painter, and Natalie Barney, who was like a writer and a socialite in Paris in the 20s. And they both really craved solitude, but they were in love, they were partners for like 50 years, and they tried at a certain point to build a house together where they would have. It was a one residence, but it would have separate bedrooms, separate entrances, and like separate, I think separate living rooms. And then they would have their own servants. So it was like they were trying to create, you know, solitude That's a and togetherness. I can get behind. <laughs> and goodness. it didn't work. So the painter, <laughs> the painter needed more solitude, and the writer needed more visitors, and it, it didn't work out. So okay. um, anyway, so they needed separate houses. You guys are bringing up a lot, like when I was reading this, by the way, I do make the joke about how prolific would all of these creators be in the modern era of Mm -hmm. social media. And like the gasket of creativity gets released a little too often if you're on Twitter, right? Your one liners go out on Twitter, but that could have been a phenomenal Mm -hmm. chapter in a book you'll never write. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I kind of think like, oh, I wish there was another like a Bill and Ted's four where we bring some of these people who are having mood disorders or addiction issues or I can't do anything because my wife or my husband whistles and bring them to modern day and be like, do every, I'm just going to create a vacuum and here's the noise canceling headphones or, you know, how do we, yeah. uh, it's just kind of amazing to think We're about We're going to cure your gout. Have... Yes, and... yes. <laughs> you have at least one more novel in you. Get through diabetes, <laughs> god damn it. Yeah. <laughs> There's so, a WeWork uh, membership and a noise canceling headphones. <laughs> oh F. Scott Fitzgerald Sp- yeah. is like over at the coffee machine the whole time. Did you try these Doritos? Cool Ranch. Can you believe it? Yeah, he goes to AA. You know, we get the whole thing. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about and, and bring this really spectacular conversation to a close is, and this I'm doing this purely for selfish reasons. So I live alone. I don't have, I'm, I'm, there's no one I need to crowd out and no one's crowding me out. Um, you know, I think about uh, the Jane Austen, right? So Jane Austen, because she was a woman, she never really had an opportunity to be solo. She had to operate within this family system. And so much so that they that she used to hide her work when a visitor came. So it wasn't obvious that she was a writer at this time. Mm-hmm. And it was sort of like her sisters and mother ran interference right like took up the slack because they recognized her genius is that is that a fair thing to say yeah i think that's a good summary i mean the great detail is that she you know they would be sitting around in a room together sewing and jane austen would be writing and if a visitor were to arrive this is an era when visitors kind of showed up unannounced um she would you know tuck the the writing away like underneath the sewing materials um and like the great detail is that there was a squeaky hinge on the door that led to the sewing room and she refused to let anyone fix the squeaky hinge because it was the hinge was the signal someone was coming so she could like tuck her writing away um and sometimes i think like we all need that squeaky hinge you know it's the it's the warning sign you know as as a quick aside it's those kind of details that make your books really wonderful mason um and i remember reading a book about writing and and the um, the writer, uh, his name escapes me, talked about find out the dog's name. Mm. You know, and it's you don't refer to the dog, you refer to the dog as, you know, Mr. Snugglesworth or whatever the dog's name is as a way to. And, and, and your books are filled with lots of Mr. Snugglesworth, you know, types of details and nice memorable things and things that make it make it super real. I have to say also that Jane Austen, chapter got me in a way that I didn't expect because I'm going to admit something, you guys. I've never read Jane Austen and I have female parts. <laughs> and I can't confirm that, but I'm going to take your word at that. Uh, I've got a list of 75 people if you'd like to <laughs> fact check. Um, 
but what was so beautiful and absolutely speaks to what Peter's saying, your tone in each chapter felt like it really grabbed the essence, the energy, the like unspoken, the intangible of each one of these creators' lives and, and era. And no joke, Jane Austen, I was like, this is all fluff. Blah, I don't need to. Now I'm like, oh my gosh, she had wing women. She was in a family unit with the coolest women who were like, no one needs to find this out. She's amazing. We have no idea like where this is going to go, but let's protect it. Let's all create a web of lies so that she can be her best self. And I mean, it's just love. It's privilege. It's Mm -hmm. a lot of things that uh, the little I know from the movie posters, that's what she's been writing about. So it's kind of interesting to have someone who's reflecting of her time in like the of the time Lena Dunham, you know? Hold on. I have to point out this one thing is that in, in, so Jane Austen has written wonderful books. She in some ways has set back solo living tremendously as a result of those. And there's a great irony in this. And that is that she wrote stories about people coupling up and following romantic love. And what it was was familial love that allowed her to write these books. Mm. And there's a, there's, a, there's a delicious irony in, in all of this. And that if Jane Austen had actually done what happens in her books, she would not be able to write those books. Because That's Mr. Really Darcy point. would not let her do it. Because Mr. Mm-hmm. Darcy, you know... Because they were still in a, in a stage where you still sort of owned your wife. And was she, did she pass as a solo? Did mm-hmm. she ever couple up? No, she never married. I mean, you- <laughs> mind blown. <laughs> so everything is a wish. Everything is a wish and a dream and a fantasy. And aren't we glad she didn't do it? I, yes. That's I funny. now have a new totem that I need to bring into my life. It's the image. It's a bust of Jane Austen. <laughs> the last thing that I will say about your book, Mason, I know you're, I know you're blushing right now, is everyone, just ignore the one-star reviews, okay? <laughs> because those people don't know. They don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> if you want a comedic reading of all of your one-star reviews, I'd I know, be I, happy. I know, I know oh, a yeah, gal. Go for it. I know. Yeah. Yeah. The yes, last thing is, this, is, and I was setting this up earlier, is that I like to go to a cafe and have my ritual. If we could bring this all the way back around. I like to have my cappuccino made by someone else. Sometimes a hateful hipster, but usually like I, I prefer a nice, lovely, friendly barista. And I like to do this sort of in public, but I have my noise canceling earphones and so on. So this idea of, a, of solitude within a crowd is something that I like. I like the energy. And I'm curious, does that... What great thinker am I like? Is is there one? Hmm. Or am I at a disadvantage? Am I am I purposely putting myself at a disadvantage because of the delightfulness of of European cafes? No, I don't. I, don't, I think you're in good company. I'm just struggling to think of like the great genius example because it's really a thing that a lot of writers need to get out of the house and be in a crowded space, and it's a like you say, it's a different kind of energy you can draw on. Um, but I might have to get back there's to you a, about there, I want to just say this. There's, there's a, um, to me, it's part of it's just being in that other space, you know, kind of the, the, the Howard Schultz of, of Starbucks identified it as a third space. I don't want it to be too crowded. Like there's sort of a, like, you know, this pandemic 25% occupancy thing, I could really get behind that forever. <laughs> <laughs> if your, if your coffee now was $10, they could pull that off. I might be willing to pay, you know? <laughs> I might be willing to pay. It's still cheaper than a WeWorks in store, you know, <laughs> it membership. Could be. It depends on how many I have. <laughs> Which makes me think actually now I am gonna drop his name. I think I'm much I think I'm a Carl Young because <laughs> I do talk to my, my pots and pans. What? As, yes, I talk to the things in my house. I say thank you to my things. When I get rid of my things, I think say thank you for your ah. service and I donate them. So I am in a little bit of Patricia Highsmith, let's be honest, like wackadoo, what? (laughs) I don't go to parties with snails in my purse, that's weird. But um, in the idea that like the solitude and the joy that you find in creating the work that you're doing, but your work is based on interaction Mm -hmm. with other human beings, which is all of Carl Jung. And Mason, Mm -hmm. when you were researching this book at the New York Public Library, that's a public space. And, mm-hmm. and was there mm-hmm. something, did that enhance or hurt your process? Oh, that's a good question. I think it, um, 
I think a little bit of both. I mean, there is a certain way in which if you're at the library, you just kind of have to read, you know what I mean? Like this is pre, I was doing this kind of when the iPhone was first coming out, this is like pre-Instagram and stuff. So yeah, you can really, if you spend two hours, three hours at the library, like that feels like a long time. <laughs> like you can, you know, if you really spend that time reading and researching, um, and I do kind of miss, I mean, not really being out at the libraries these days, not being out in public. I miss that, um, that's, Space you get into when it's just you and a ton of books and nothing else to do. <laughs> it's like so rare you find yourself with just one thing in front of you and nothing else competing for your attention. So I think overall it was good. Including well, snacks, no snacks in front of you. My God, <laughs> yeah, no snacks, <laughs> no donuts and uh, and sugar to dip them in. I see your jawline, Mason. I see you're a healthy man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You too, Peter. You're pretty too. Uh -huh. Not in this lighting. So <laughs> I want to thank, first of all, I want to thank Lily because I gave her homework yes. and I am a tough grader and, and I'm going to say that I was going to say this off the air, Lily, but I'm going to say it on the air. And that is, I'm really proud of you. You, you, you brought it today. Oh, thanks, man. You did, and the reason you were able to bring it was because you took some time in solitude to digest this work and to, and your and your normal sense of overachieving. <laughs> so I, I want to say thank I want to say thank you on behalf of the listeners uh, to this. And if and if you're a listener, you didn't like this. I think you should find a different podcast because it doesn't get much better than this. Let's say, uh, you, Mason. Peter. I appreciate you. I appreciate these books that you've written. They've helped me in my own personal life. They've helped countless of my friends and, and colleagues who I've given them to. And, uh, and if I may, is there something that you're working on now that you can tell us about? Yeah, yeah. I'm starting a new book project, and it's going to be a history of making art and making a living. So day jobs, patrons, get-rich-quick schemes, strategic marriages, um, petty theft, uh, whatever it took uh, from like the Renaissance to the present day. I, it's, it's, I'm just about to officially announce it, so I don't know when this is going to air, but this might be the first time that I've actually mentioned it publicly. Do you have a working title? Yeah, my working title comes from Moby Dick, of course. And uh, there's a line where the narrator says, oh, something like, oh, time, strength, cash, patience. Like he's wishing for the time and the strength and the cash to write his tale properly. And I thought, what a great title for a book about like trying to have the resources to do your work. Time, strength, cash, patience. Oh, We'll see if that ends up being the title. Hold while I have that tattooed on the other inside of my <laughs> oh, thank you. eyelid. <laughs> thank you, both of you. This was wonderful. Thank you so much, Peter. And thank you, Mason. It was a pleasure to do this homework. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, guys. It was really fun. I appreciate it. Cheers. Thank you for listening to Solo, the single person's guide to a remarkable life. For more about our guests and show notes, go to petermcgraw.org. Please subscribe and share with your single friends.